main set of things, main set of beliefs that were wrong that people around the Prophet believed? Who can give me some ideas? Yes. Okay, grave worship and the intercession. Sharing partners with Allah. Worship, perfect. Worshipping idols. Okay, right. What else? Old traditions, culture, cultural traditions that they couldn't accept for belief or Islam to come and change. What else? Okay, beautiful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they wanted him to be an angel or a wealthy person or a certain way, a certain tribe. So the Quran addresses all of these questions and all of these doubts with logical, logical arguments or logical speech from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that anybody can understand and be convinced by. Very powerful words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these questions and doubts that people would have. And then one century after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we now have multiple groups. You have the Khawarij, you have the Qadariyya, people who don't believe in Qadr or people who believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forces human will. You have the Shia. This group start to split. And every century, the scholars of that century get up and they begin to respond to the doubts spread by those different groups. In our century, in our, the time that we live in, you think about it, we live in, in the UK, which is in Europe. And the, the greatest doubt or the greatest set of ideas that stand up against Islam is the idea that God does not exist or that religion is nonsense or that science replaces religion. These are the three main ideas out there in the world around us. And if you're here, you're growing up here, you have kids, you have friends here, you're going to hear of those ideas at some point in time. You're going to hear them at school, you're going to hear them at university, you're going to hear them outside the masjid, you're going to come across them at some point. And so it's important to be protected, it's important to be able to engage in a discussion about these ideas. Okay. Now, we'll start with a very important quote from Shaykh al-Islam, Ahmad ibn Abdul Salam ibn Taymiyyah al-Harrani al-Dimashqi. He says, this is the principle. Common sense, you can say, common sense can never come against or contradict with authentic revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can never happen. It's impossible. Now, if we, if we take it one step further, we can say that in today's world, common sense and facts, established facts about the world around us, and the revelation that came from Allah, these three things can never be in contradiction. They are always in harmony. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created this world is the one who sent down the revelation. And Allah who created this human brain is the one who sent down the revelation. They cannot be in contradiction. They cannot go against each other. This is the principle upon which we are going to continue in this workshop. We're going to use this principle and going to prove how you can go about understanding the world around you with this principle in mind. So now, the first question for all of you. How do we know things? How do you learn about things? How do you know something is true? What are, what are the sources of knowledge for a Muslim, for a human being? Let's say this table is white. How do you know this? Or let's say I tell you there's a, there's a Commonwealth Games happening in Birmingham. How do you know about that? What are the ways you can know? Who can help you? Okay, visual. You can see something, you know it's happening. What else? You hear something. Okay, yes. You use your mind. Give me an example, something you use your mind to know. Day and night. Okay. You can see something, you can see the sun moving, etc. And you can also think that there's a pattern, right? There's a pattern going on. It makes sense. Okay. Good. What else? Okay, physically touch it. What else? There's one that's missing, yes. Revelation. Now, revelation is a type of, some, it's a type of information. What kind of information is it? Yes. Sorry? Reading. Okay. Reading, revelation, newspapers. All of these are of the same category. Who can tell me what the category is? Yes, testimony. Someone comes, someone else comes and tells you something you didn't know. 
Like for example, Muhammad told me that the Commonwealth Games are happening in Birmingham. I didn't know. I didn't see it. I haven't seen the Commonwealth Games, right? But someone I trust is telling me it's happening. It's happening, right? Now, how do you guys know it's happening? Where did you find out about it? Sorry? You can see it. You've been to the games. You can see something's going on in town, but you don't know what's going on. So someone, whether it's the news or whether it's social media, somewhere you've read the Commonwealth Games are happening. This is a report from someone else trustworthy. Whether it's the news, or whether it's Muhammad, or whether it's Adam, whether it's Fatima, someone trustworthy has given you some information. And revelation, Al-Quran, is a form of trustworthy information. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the source. He came and told us that Allah revealed this to him. And we trust him. And the Quran itself is information from Allah. For example, it for, just, just like you haven't seen the Commonwealth Games, right? But you know it's, it's there. You've seen some evidences, some people have told you, right? Similarly, the Quran informs us of things we've never seen, right? But we trust it because we, it's a credible source. So these are the three, the three ways you can know anything that you know. Number one is the senses, eyes, hearing, touch, etc. Number two is a report, a trustworthy report or a report from a truthful person. And number three is the human mind. You know, what kind of things do you know from the human mind? For example, there are some principles, what we call common sense, right? So for instance, if I told you, my car is outside, it's moving, and it's staying still at the same time. Will you believe me? Why, why wouldn't you believe me? It doesn't make sense, right? It's in, you know, in logic, it's called the law of non-contradiction. A thing cannot be, two opposite things cannot happen at the same time. I can't be moving and still at the same time. I'm either moving or I'm still. Your pizza can't be pepperoni or chicken tikka. You have to choose one. Maybe you can meld them together, but yeah. You, these are some things that we, we call common sense. For example, if, you say to your, say, if I say to you, I have a pizza, and one slice of this pizza was bigger than the whole pizza. Is it possible? It's not possible. You, would, you wouldn't believe me. Whether you saw the pizza or you didn't see the pizza, your mind rejects it. Because the part is always less than the whole. Okay? So these are some things in the mind. They are self-evident truths. Nobody needs to prove them. We all know it's true. One plus one is two. Opposites can't happen at the same time. The, the part is less than the whole, etc., etc. So these are the ways you can know things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned these three in the Quran. Allah says, who can tell me the Arabic? Can you have fathed here? Allahu akhrajakum. I mean, not buyuti ummahatikum. Not from your mother's houses. From your mother's? I mean, butuni ummahatikum. Allah exited you from the wombs of your mothers. And you knew nothing when you came out. And he gave you the faculty of hearing, which is where you get the reports from, and sight, the senses, touch, feel, taste, and minds, al afida. So you should be grateful to Allah. It's from these faculties, you know everything that you know. Okay. Now, some people are, go to extremes in these sources of knowledge. So some people say, for instance, the only way you can know anything is you have to touch it, see it, or smell it. There's no other way you can know anything. So my grandfather doesn't exist. I never saw him. Never touched him, never smelled him, never licked him. Okay. These are the people, when it comes to Allah, what do they say? We don't see him. So we don't, he doesn't exist. And there's so many things in their life they know, but they've not touched it or smelt it or heard about it. They know it because someone came and told them about it. So that's one form of extremism. You can only know something if you can smell it. So if someone comes and says to you, Allah doesn't exist because whereas we don't see Him. We don't have proof for Him. You say, what kind of proof? Physical proof? Yeah, you will never get physical. You cannot touch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot see Him with your naked eye. But is that the only type of proof? Is that the only way of you can find out anything? That's not, that's not possible. Okay, the second extremism. People who say you can only know things through the mind. Everything has to be 
logical. Everything has to be rational. If it's not, it doesn't exist. It's not true. It's not possible. And there are things you find out, not just because of your logic, but because you see it, you hear it, you smell it. Someone informs you of it. Like, for example, a child. Someone informs a child that metal can fly, aeroplanes. This child is in disbelief. How can, it, how can metal go in the air? It may not understand it with his brain, but it doesn't mean it's not true. Okay? Now, the way in Islam, these sources of knowledge work together. They are not meant to be against each other. So the mind processes all of this information, whatever you see and whatever you hear from others. Now, here's the question to all of you. The question to all of you is, from these three sources of knowledge, which source of knowledge or information do we get most of our knowledge from? Most of what you know, where is that coming from? Is it coming from your mind? Is it coming from reports? Is it coming from touch, taste, feel, your senses? Yes. From testimony? From reports? Yes. You think reports? So give, me some, give me an example of something you know that you didn't touch, feel or taste, but you know because someone informed you. Emotions. We've never seen emotions. Okay, we've never touched them. But you know they exist. Someone informs you there's such a thing called emotions. Yes. You've never been to certain countries. The Great Wall of China. Anybody been to the Great Wall of China? I've been there. I'm telling you it exists. You have to trust me now. <laughs> You've got to trust me. Yeah. I didn't find Yajuj Ma'juj there. I was looking with my telescope. They were not there near the wall. For, so for those who had the theory, I'm afraid I didn't find them. Maybe, inshallah, you might be successful. Okay. Okay, third. Uh, so yes, everything you learn in school. In school, you learn about photosynthesis, about plants, animals, the solar system. Did you see the solar system with your eyes? No. You learn the earth is round. Have you seen the earth's sphere with your eyes? No. You trust someone else trustworthy has told you this. Most of what we know is from a report from a trustworthy person or source. The news, maybe not that trustworthy anymore. The news, it's all testimony. It's someone else giving you information. You've not seen it, you've not touched it, you've not smelt it. Your mind is not telling you about it. Someone else is informed. There's an earthquake here. There's a crisis here. The prices are going down, are going up. There's a war here. It's all, most of what we know is from a, a report from a trustworthy, truthful person. Okay. I'll give you an example now to ask the question. The World Cup. How do you know the World Cup happened? If I'm telling you there was a World Cup in 2000 and let's say 16, whenever it was, how do you know the World Cup happened and it's not all a lie, a conspiracy theory? What's the evidence? You can watch it. Is that the same as seeing it? Can videos be doctored and faked? Could be. You can watch it live. Could a live stream be faked? You can be there. Okay, let's say you weren't there, right? But I'm informing you or... Basically, how did you know the World Cup is true? Yeah, we're saying live stream can be faked, yes. Okay, millions of people agree it happened, yes. You weren't putting your hand up, you're stretching your fingers. Sheikh, come on. Yes. Through testimony. But there's a specific type of testimony here. It's mass testimony. It's impossible for Ahmed and Hamza and Betty and CNN, and BBC, and Reuters, and all these people to have a secret meeting and say, look, let's go and tell the world a lie that there was such a thing called the World Cup. We'll fake all the videos, all the pictures, everything. It's very unlikely that this was a conspiracy theory because there's such a huge number of people from different times, places, languages who have no connection to each other. They're all saying the same thing. This in Arabic you call, in Islamic sciences, in Hadith sciences, who knows what this is called? That's fine. Mutawatir. All the students of knowledge, you, you failed me. But our brother, mashallah, he succeeded. Mutawatir, which means mass transmitted. Okay. Now, here's another example. Different type of testimony. You ask me who won last night's game. I tell you Manchester City won the game. Why would you trust the information from me? Why would you not trust the information from me? Okay, is it possible I'm wrong? 
Why, why could I be wrong? What, what would make me wrong? Okay, if you don't trust me, it's probably likely, but what does that mean? What are you saying about me? I'm lying, okay? What's the other option? I might have watched the wrong game. I made a mistake. I was watching Atletico Madrid. I thought I was watching Manchester City. I got the jerseys mixed up, okay? I could make a mistake or I could be lying. Or what's the third option? Sorry? I'm insane, which comes under the same idea that I'm not, trust I'm not trustworthy. Okay? And then the last option is, I'm telling the truth. And I didn't make a mistake. Now, how would you make sure I'm not lying? My reputation, my bio, my character. That tells you whether I'm a liar, I'm not a liar. Okay? What would tell you that I didn't make a mistake? It's okay. Hisham is truthful. He's a truthful guy, honest guy. May Allah make me of the Siddiqeen and all of us here. But what if I made a mistake? How would you make sure I didn't make a mistake? You go to another trustworthy source and you double check, right? Yes? Okay. So this is how, this is some taste of how the hadith scholars would ensure that reports were true. Somebody would say something, they heard somebody say something about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would investigate this person's bio, this person's character, and then they would cross-check with other people to make sure this person is telling the truth, and they didn't make a mistake. That's the whole science of hadith summarized in those two things. Okay. So you have two kinds of reports. One is this mass transmission. Everyone says it, like across the world. You cannot deny it. It's like denying you exist. And the second is a few trustworthy sources or one trustworthy person tells you something is true. Okay. These are the two types of reports that you can get. Earthquake on the news. This is another example of testimony. You have not seen the earthquake. The video could have been doctored. The video could be fake. But you trust the source. I'm not seeing anything about this particular source. Okay? Now, now I'm going to bring it back to Revelation. How do you know? How do you know? How can we prove, why, how can we prove to someone, a non-Muslim, there are things we don't see like angels. They are true. They are facts. And they really exist. Talk to the person next to you. You have three minutes. You have to prove to me as a non-Muslim, why should I believe in angels? Why should, I not, why should I believe in angels and I shouldn't believe in fairies and pixies and unicorns? Talk to the person next to you. You have three minutes. the sisters, there is a Slido, uh, there is a Slido for interaction if you have questions or you want to add comments, if you go to slido.com and you put in the hashtag GLM sisters, you can scan this QR code, GLM sisters, put in the hashtag and you can add your comments or your questions and we'll address them inshallah. Brothers, be social. Talk to the person next to you, please. If you're not discussing with the person next to you, I'm going to pick on you. They're going to be exposed.
Okay, enough time, enough discussion. One faida, one unrelated point. Who is in our company? Who is it that we hope is in our company here? Angels. The Prophet said, Any people who gather in a house from the houses of Allah, are we in a house of Allah? Inshallah we are. يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ فِيمَا بَيْنَهُمْ They study the book of Allah or the, its meanings or its sciences and they discuss it with each other إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ بِهِ مُسْتَكِينَ عَلَيْهِ مُسْتَكِينَ Peace descends upon them وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ Mercy envelops them وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهُ And Allah mentions you amongst the angels May Allah make us amongst them I mean. And that's why you feel slightly sleepy in this gathering You suddenly start to feel very drowsy and tired because the angels are, and the peace is descending, and suddenly you can see the, Z, the Zs coming out of the corner of your head. Okay. Explain to me. As a Muslim, why do you believe things, why do you believe things exist that I can't see? Like angels. Uncle. Okay, belief. But I'm not convinced. Okay. Take it back to the, how we know things are true. Yeah. So where's the source well, then I'm, how do you know angels exist? Which source did you get it from? Did you see them? No. Quran. That's fine. The Quran is a form of what? I've lost my battery. <laughs> keep going. Keep talking, keep talking. Dialing for technical support. Technical support. 911. We are in need of urgent assistance. Sheikh Muhammad, Sheikh Anas. Yes. While they are sorting out, yeah. Okay. How do you know revelation is true? We, taught, we know it was true. We, we were taught that revelation is true. Your parents taught you it was true. Yeah. What for you personally, what makes why why do you think Muhammad was a true prophet and not a liar? Anything. Something small for you. Alas. He knows the truth deep down in his bones. Right? And there's probably many things that come into that. You know, we can't always explain why. It's, you know it. You know it. And this is what you call the fitrah of the human being. Sometimes you cannot explain what's in the fitrah, what's in your instinct. It's in your instinct. It's like you ask somebody, you know, people who are experienced in fishing. You ask them, how do you know this is a good fish? He says, Habibi, I know fish. I've been 20 years in the sea. Okay? I can smell a good fish from distance. He can't always explain why. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So we're just trying to unpack yeah? Okay, who can help? Help, Uncle, what's your name? Ishan? Irshad. Yes. You are, you are having a passionate discussion with Uncle Irshad. No, no, you can't get here with the same thing. Why do you believe in angels? Okay. Okay, now we're coming. The Prophet ﷺ told us. Okay, and he has spoken facts. What facts? Give me some. The splitting of the moon. Okay, what else? Okay, the Prophet ﷺ has said things which he could not have known on his own. That makes him a messenger. And that makes whatever he says trustworthy. Whether I get it, I don't get it, I see it, I don't see it, I trust him now. Because he's given prophecies, because he's predicted things, because he's said things and they've happened. I'm helping you to lay out the reasoning. So he is a trustworthy source. Therefore, you trust what he's saying. Who else can help? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so he's saying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through many miracles and many evidences, we know he's a messenger, a true messenger, not a liar, not an imposter. And he informed us angels exist. That's enough. You don't even need to continue. But then we're adding to that 
many people have experienced angels, many people from different places and times, and therefore that's another ad additional evidence that they exist. Okay, anybody else want to add something to this? Osman, you want to add anything to this? Inshallah later. Osman is processing. Yes. Hmm. So he's saying Allah says in the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ is a mercy to us. That's why you believe in angels. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ was sent to as a mercy to the worlds. One of the miracles of the Prophet is his character and his mercy. That's why we know he's a he's a true messenger. He had no secret motivation, not money, not women, not status, not power, nothing. And he informs us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs him through the Quran إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Therefore we believe it's true. So this is one example. My computer is still not working, so we will freestyle it. Eventually it will come up. So we know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us and we trust he is a good Source, a trustworthy source. Now, if you don't believe in the Prophet ﷺ to be a messenger, or you don't believe in the Quran, there's no reason for you to believe in angels. You have to trust in testimony. Right? While the computer, while the battery is uh, on its way to coming back. Now, Moving on to this, the next point after this. We said there's three sources of knowledge. Who can tell me the three sources? Number one? The senses. Number two? The mind. Number three? A trustworthy source. A report from somebody. Yeah? Okay. Now each of these three sources, these three sources of information, of knowledge, you can have different levels of confidence in what you find out from them. I'll give you an example. I'm telling you that I saw an alien outside the masjid. How much confidence do you have? Zero confidence. Okay? But I'm telling you I saw it. It's a report. But you don't trust the report. Why don't you trust my report? We have many testimonies of aliens not being real, of people making this stuff up. Okay, good. Now, I'll give you another example. A weak hadith. There's a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and I say it's a weak hadith. What does that mean? It's a report that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said something. But how possible is it that this report, the Prophet said this? How, out of one hundred percent, how much will you give it? Yeah, I'm telling you, it's a weak hadith. Hmm. Yeah. Who reported after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Yeah. Sorry? Their memory might be weak, etc., etc. Okay. But the outcome, I told you, it's a weak hadith. Out of 10, what's the likelihood the Prophet said this, roughly? 5%. Okay. I would say between 0 and 49%. Da'if is actually quite a big spectrum. There are some Da'if hadith, there's many, many Da'if narrations, so it goes up in percentage of possibility, the Prophet said. 40, 30, 40. Some, are, some weak hadith are so weak. It's most likely a lie. It's a zero or it's five. So it has levels. I'll give you another example. Okay. A scientific theory. So there's a scientist. He had a theory that the earth is at the center of the universe and the sun is going around the earth. This is his theory. This is a real theory that the scientist had a couple of centuries ago. The earth is at the center and the sun is running around the earth. How much out of 10, how much do you trust that this is probably true? 100%? 0%? Yeah. Okay, you're saying the Quran says something else, you don't trust that. Okay. Yeah, yeah? The earth goes around the sun. Okay, but this, just this, any, any scientific theory, how much would you give it out of 10? How much trust? Okay, 50%. Who else? Yeah, 50%? Anybody else? 
25%. Yeah, Rajul, come on. All the effort that went into these theories and all of the data that was collected. Alas. Okay, so we're saying 25 to 50%. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody want to be a bit more charitable? Generous? 80%. Okay. Now I tell you, I tell you about, there's a, there's a fact. It's not a theory, it's a fact. Scientific fact, the earth is round. How much will you trust this information? Oh, do we have any flat earthers in the house? <laughs> MashaAllah. Ahl Birmingham. Yes. Okay, it depends. He wants to investigate. How did you say it's a fact? What does fact really mean? This is good. Always ask questions. Yes. You want to know the proof. There's a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. That's how I know the Earth is round. Do you trust, is it 20, 30, 40% or is it more than 50? Or what would you say? More than 50. Okay. What I'm trying to say to you is, each of these sources of information, it can give you information that's 0% true, 30% possibility, 100% possibility, 70% possibility. It can give you information of different strengths. Okay, so we talked about report. Okay, for example, we said the mind is one of the sources of information. Uh, my, let's say there's a very elderly uncle in this masjid. May Allah bless him. Okay. And uh, one day, he's in his late 80s, and he's telling you, he's telling you that he spent uh, a few days in prison with Nelson Mandela. Trust him? Trustworthy information? Trustworthy? Potentially trustworthy. Huh? He, he's in the masjid. <laughs> he can't be lying, mashallah. Okay, the point is, right, we said there's three different sources of knowledge, but each of these sources can give you information of different quality. I tell you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qul Allahu ahad. How much do you trust Allah said this? How, why? I could make up this ayah. How do you know? It's Allah said it. Mass transmitted, right? If you ask uncle there, did Allah say, Qul Allah, he will tell you. We have no connection. I don't have his WhatsApp number. I don't know him. We didn't conspire behind the scenes. Maybe we did, you never know. But you go out on the road, you call someone in Indonesia, they will all tell you, Qul Allah, this is mass transmission. The Quran is mass transmitted. That's how you know it's true. Okay. We already did this. So, what I want you to learn is how to ask the right questions. Someone tells you there's a report, there's a hadith, or someone says, I saw a UFO, you ask the same questions. How authentic is this information? How many people reported this information? Did everybody understand it the same way, or could it be understood in different ways? What's your name, Akhi? Sorry? Talha. I saw Talha last week. I, I didn't see this real Talha. Let's say, imagine, I saw Talha last week, I come and tell you. I saw Talha last week, and alcohol was dripping from his beard. What conclusion will you get to? Someone splashed alcohol on him. This is how a Muslim should think. Right? I give you some information, but could it be understood in a different way? Or is there only one way to see this, in, this event? Okay. Now with the senses. Is the man's senses working properly? How many others saw what he saw? When you come to the mind, rational information. Is this a clear, logical point the person is making or is there some issues with the point they're making always ask questions whenever you hear any information this is a principle general principle okay. and we always ask questions when you hear some information except information that's 100% certain like information from the Quran you know the Quran 100% is preserved an authentic hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know it's true, you know he said it. Now the only question is, what does it mean? You cannot say he didn't say it. A sahih hadith. 100% or close to 100% the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it. Or a mutawatir, a mass transmitted hadith. 
من كذب علي متعمدا فليتبوء مقعده من النار whoever lies about the prophet let them take a seat in the fire this hadith is mutawatir mass translated the prophet sallallahu definitely said it 100% okay so any source of knowledge you can have different levels of trust confidence in how true this knowledge is okay so some things are 100% certain for example england is a country this is 100% true allah exists this is an undeniable truth this table is white this you see it with your eyes right it's undeniably true that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said x in the quran this is undeniably true okay some things are probably true but we can't rule out that it's wrong it's it's it's, it's not true for example if i said it will probably snow later this month maybe but maybe not right i could be wrong the weather forecast could be wrong a scientific theory possibly it's true but possibly it's not true right a hasan hadith not sahih not authentic hasan sound between weak and authentic it's possibly the prophet sallallahu said it but possibly not okay then you have some things that are unlikely to be true most likely they're false like for example someone saying the earth is flat most likely you're wrong or you hear a report from someone is not someone who's not trustworthy you've seen them lying you've seen them cheating you've seen them scamming then they come and tell you they saw a ufo Assalamu. or is someone drinking alcohol then they come and they tell you akramakumullah some information you you can you're right to doubt are they fully in their senses or not okay in arabic there are words for these levels of certainty something that's 100% true you call qat'i in arabic if you want to write it down qat'i something probably true you call it dhanni dhanni and something probably untrue you call it wahmi okay now from these different sources of knowledge the quran tells you something now we come to the crux of discussion the quran tells you something your brain doesn't make sense of it it doesn't make sense to me or science tells you something and the quran tells you something else which one should you accept which one should you reject Accept the Quran, but better understand what exactly it's saying. Good. Anybody else? So you're saying if it's your mind that can't make sense of it, something might be wrong with your mind. You may have not understood it well. Or if it's science going against revelation, that theory might be false. It might be true. We don't know. But revelation, this is an important point. Revelation, we have 100% trust it's true. An ayah from the Qur'an or a hadith of the Prophet that's our first point of truth. That's how we orient ourselves in this world. For us, that is the number one truth. And then we try and recalibrate. You know, sometimes you have your GPS, you're going somewhere, and you're on uh, Coventry Road, but it's showing that you're in South Africa. What do you need to do with the compass, usually, with the phone? You need to do in a figure of eight, right? Make sure it's, it's, it's uh, thinking properly again. It's calibrated properly. So sometimes we have to recalibrate our minds. Okay. But the point is, there's no... What people usually do when they find something from science that goes against the Qur'an, they do either outright rejection of science or they throw the Qur'an in the bin. billah. So either they leave Islam or they just say everything from science is wrong. And the point that we need to remember is it depends. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah in his book al-Aql wa al He says the important thing to look at is not where did the information come from? Did it come from here or did it come from there? The important thing to look at how strong is the level of certainty? If this table is white. If any report tells you this table is black, you need to recheck that report. Or you need to reinterpret it, understand it in a different way. Maybe it meant black at night, which is fair. But it's not black in the daytime. You need to maybe understand it in a different way. But it, it, doesn't de- it depends on which one is the strongest evidence that you have. That's what you have to, that's what you have to give preference for. If you have a weak hadith, 
you have a weak hadith. It's most likely the Prophet ﷺ didn't say it. And it goes against something from common sense. Which one would you choose? Which one would you make sense of more? Which one would you prefer? The hadith is weak. It's unlikely the Prophet said it. Then common sense. That can be unpacked. They can, but this is something when people say revelation comes over reason in all cases, that's not, it's not true technically. Sometimes if the, this revelation is unlikely to be true, it's a fabricated hadith. For example, Al Jannah to Tahta Akdam al Ummahat. Paradise is at the feet of the mother. This favorite hadith of all parents. Whenever you're not listening, whenever you're not coming to the table, paradise is at my feet. If you don't kiss my feet, no Jannah, firdu, no Firdaus for you, nothing for you in Jannah. This hadith, many scholars said it's weak or it's fabricated. Okay. There's other hadith about the virtues of parents and other ayat, but this particular hadith, it's weak or fabricated. So if I ask you, is Jannah at the feet of the mothers? You can say, no, it's not true. That hadith is not true. For example, so you have to look at which piece of information is the most certain. And then you make sense of everything else. This is the principle. Now, so I'll summarize everything we did so far. There are three sources of truth. The senses, the mind, and the reports. We place different levels of trust in these sources depending on various factors. How trustworthy is the person? Where is the information coming from? Is the person sane? Etc. Etc. The Quran is a form of truthful, undeniable, mass transmitted report. Similar to the statement, France exists. You can't deny this. Most issues in the world today, people rejecting religion, people rejecting information, people having conspiracy theories, all of these come from either they're taking things only from one source of knowledge and rejecting the others, or they don't know how to deal with the differences between information that they get. Okay. Now we come to the second part of this workshop. We talked about reports. Yes, go on. You had a question? Oh, you want to take a picture. Okay, this is a summary of the first part. Now then we will talk a little bit about science and then we will go straight into some good examples to test whether you all understood or you didn't understand. How much can you trust knowledge that comes from science? We said it's one of the sources of knowledge, right? Some of you said 30%, some of you 70%, right? Okay, let's dig a little bit more detail. Okay, who here has taken GCSE science? Put your hand up. Some of you are uncertain, or doing it, or going to do it. Okay. So all of you have studied science in some way. Yeah? Who of you learned something in GCSE science that contradicted what you learned from the Quran? What did you learn? Big Bang Theory contradicts the Quran. Is very good. We will come to this in one of our case studies examples. Does the Big Bang contradict what's in the Quran? Yes. Okay. Good point. He's saying the issue is not the Big Bang, but the idea that it came by itself. Nothing caused it. Correct? Yeah? Yes. Darwin's theory of evolution. Hmm. This is something you learned in science, you thought, I don't agree with it. Yes. Okay, yes, similarly, si similarly what to what Brother was saying, right? Theory of evolution. Anything else you learned? Yeah. Repeat your question. Is it a question? Yeah, repeat your question. I mean, it would be in agreement with the Quran. Yes. So the idea is, anything that's a 100% true fact about the world will be in agreement with the Quran. That's not the same as saying anything from science will be in agreement. It's about how true is it. And what we're going to look at now is, is everything from science 100% true? The first thing you need to understand, we said there's three sources of knowledge, right? One of them we said was the 
senses. Taste, touch, feel. Here, Junaid, what did you have for breakfast? Karak chai. How did it taste? Sweet. Okay. Are we 100% certain what he tasted was sweet? If someone tells him that that tea is bitter, who should he believe? Us or his own sense? No, his own sense. He tasted it, right? Okay. Science, some scientist or scientific body or a paper or a journal tells you there's X scientific theory. Is it the same thing? No, right? I saw a glass. This, I saw a glass with my eyes. I'm 100% sure I saw a glass. You cannot tell me there was no glass here. Or I was dreaming. Or there was something in the water. Okay. But if I tell you there's a theory that this glass, the reason it stays on this table is due to X force that's acting on it that we can't see. I'm telling you some theory about why the glass is on the table. Not the same, not quite the same, right? What's the difference? Science also uses observation, labs, testing. Isn't the same as what you see, what you smell? What's the difference? Why are you giving this 100% trust? This cup is here on this table. But if I tell you gravity is pushing this cup onto, onto the table, you're not giving me 150% certainty. Why? Okay, it wasn't observed by yourself. Someone else may be observed. There's more than that. Hmm. You can't see it, you can't touch gravity. Hmm? We'll go into detail now, yeah? Yes, go on. Okay, maybe you had a theory. You did an experiment. It happened one time. Maybe someone else doesn't recreate it. So your theory was wrong. Yes? Okay. There's a few things, okay? We'll go through them one by one. How does science work? Science observes something. Scientists, they observe something. And then they try and make a process, a theory, an equation out of it. So they see this glass is sitting on the table. Who remembers how the idea of gravity came about? Yeah. The apple fell on Newton's head. Okay. The apple fell on, this, on his head. Is this true or false? Well, as much as we trust Newton, we, let's say it's true. Or if you ask him, did the apple fall on your head? 100%. Now this theory that everything in the world has an invisible force pushing it downwards, that requires some maths, some, some modeling. That's him trying to figure out what made the apple fall on my head. He's saying there's a process, there's a calculation. Those things you can't see, you can't touch. So you don't place the same trust in them, the same confidence in them. It can't be 100%. It's a theory. Right? A theory is the best possible description of reality. Can theories change? Yeah? Theories can change. So if you're 100% certain that gravity is what's holding this down, then 20 years later, a new scientist comes. He says, actually, it's not gravity. It's something else. How much can you trust theories now? You can't trust someone 100%, that's for sure. Because they change. Because it's an idea of why this happens. Right? It's an idea. Someone's thinking about it. Someone's making it up. Someone's figuring it out. There's a second problem with science. It's a, we call it the problem of induction. But what science does, an experiment is done on one thing or a group of things. And then they try and make a general rule from it. So for example, I take a small group of dogs and I say, observe. I observe with my eyes, these dogs are brown. Then I, say, I make a rule out of it, all dogs are brown. Scientific experiments are done on a small group of plants or animals or things that are observed. Then they make a conclusion, everything follows the same rule. When you expand it to everything else, you could make a mistake. You don't know, maybe there's an exception. Maybe there's a white dog somewhere. Right? You saw an apple falling from the tree. You don't know. Maybe there's something that goes upwards. There's no gravity. It doesn't really fit your idea then. So generally, this is how science works, induction. It, it takes something small that's observed, and it tries to apply it to everything else. I'm really simplifying the idea, but you get the idea, right? 
Third problem with science. Theories change and evolve. On the left in this image, this is the, uh, the physicist Ptolemy. His theory was that this is how the world, the solar system looked like. The Earth is in the middle, and all the planets are going around the Earth. 100, 200 years later, someone else came, Copernicus. He said, actually, no, 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 no. Ptolemy got it wrong. The sun is in the middle, and everything else is going around the universe. Theories change. So how can they be 100% true? They're based on some evidences, some ideas, some calculations, some data, but all of that could be false. Okay? So now, knowing these three things, theories change. Science works by studying something small then applying it to everything else. Looking and observing something, but then creating a whole idea out of it, a story out of it. How much would you, certainty would you place in any scientific theory, just as a general idea? 50%. Could be true, could not be true. Yeah? Zero to 99. Okay, this is a really wide range. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. I'd say it depends, right? So if there's a theory that's backed by thousands and thousands of scientists and lots and lots of data, and there's no gaps, no criticism, no concern, you might place it between the 70 to 90% category. You know? It's likely to be true, but we're not sure. It could be wrong. If it's something that's a new idea, a few people believe it, okay, it could be 10, 20, 30%. You don't know. The point is, theories are not 100% true. Everybody understood this? Okay. So the summary of what we just went through is, science can lead to probable knowledge, vanni, ilm vanni, but not certain knowledge, ilm yaqini. That's what you see, sense. That will give you 100% true. You can never say a theory is the exact description of the world, but it's the best possible description we have right now. That's why they keep changing. They keep evolving. Okay? Now, conclusion is, science is not the same as senses. The fact that his tea is sweet is 100% certain. But the theory that sugar dissolves in water and that causes a sense of sweetness, that could be 95% true. Could be 85% true. You can't say it's 100% true. That could change five years from now. A new idea could come out. New information could come out. Breaks the whole theory. Okay? Now, there's another point. As Muslims, we should not be afraid of science. There was a period in the Muslim world where the Muslims were the pioneers of science. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of night and day, there are signs for people who think. There are those who remember Allah standing, sitting, and lying on their signs. And they reflect on how the heavens and the earth were created. And then they say, O oh Allah, you could not have made this without purpose. Subhanak. Glory be to you. Faqina adab al nar. Protect us from the fire. By these ayat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's encouragement to believers to see. Qul siru fil ard. Go and look in the earth. Fanduru kayfa bada al Go and see how Allah created things. Allah encourages us to see, to think, to explore. Muslims try to explore and understand everything in Allah's creation. Why? Why did the Muslim scholars try to understand how the eye works and how the fingers work and how the world works? Why were they so curious? Yeah. It increases the certainty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you know about this eye, the more you are certain about one thing, it could not have come by chance. Someone, something, somewhere made it for a specific, specific, specific purpose. The more you learn about the heart, and how it pumps blood around your body and the bloodstream. You go more and more amazed at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Right? And you say, Subhanaka, ma khalaqta hadha batilan. This could not have been for no reason. Yes.
Give me an example. What about things in the Quran that science can't prove, like the unseen? Now, did you miss the beginning of the workshop? It just came. Who can explain to a brother why we believe things in the unseen that science can't prove? If science can't prove it, it shouldn't exist, right? We shouldn't believe it to be true. Who can explain to a brother? Yes. Okay. One, one at a time. So first thing, uh, what's your name? Sorry? Akbar said, we just established that scientific theories are not necessarily 100% true. Okay. And the second point you made, and it's not the only... It's not the only way to know whether something's true or not. What are the other ways to know whether something's true or not? Okay, you have your five senses, but I can't see the angels. You have revelation, and revelation is a form of testimony. You believe the Quran is true. There are some evidences that tell you the Quran is true, that it's not a fake book, it's not a lie, the Prophet is not an imposter. You've established that. So whatever the Qur'an informs you of, you trust that it's true. Even if you don't see it, you can't comprehend it. We'll come to some specific examples in a session. In a second. You had your hand up? Your mind. What about your mind? You can use your mind as well to come to the conclusion something is true. So, we were saying that science lives in the area of mahsusat, observable things. Right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Science is about measuring things that in the physical world around us. Can science tell us something that doesn't exist, that we can't physically touch, see? Not necessarily. Can someone come and inform you? Someone comes to the masjid now and tells you that your sister is in prison. You haven't seen it, but you trust that what he's saying is probably true. If there's someone credible, someone you trust. Yeah? Testimony. The Quran is a form of testimony. If you trust the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and you've established and verified that he is a truthful messenger, and you trust that the Quran has been preserved and it is revelation to him, now whatever the Quran informs you of, the Prophet Wasallam informs you, you know it must be true. Just as you know the Commonwealth Games are happening in Birmingham, even though you've not seen it, you've not touched it, you've not smelt it, but you know something's going on. Yeah? So on the basis of testimony and a trustworthy source, we believe in angels. We don't believe it in blind faith. We know the Messenger وسلم, is, a, is a truthful messenger, 100% certainty, based on so many evidences. So what he said must be true. Based on that logic, there are things that science don't even explore, things in the unseen. But revelation informs us of things we don't know about. We're never going to see. We're never going to experience. If you trust the source of revelation, you will trust what is coming in revelation. And we'll come to an example of that. What if science informs you of something goes against the revelation? Or revelation informs you of something that goes against your mind? Now, this is the first example. What's your name, brother? Sorry? Ahsan. Okay. Now, Ahsan just said, you know, what about things science doesn't inform us of? Yeah? Okay. Who knows what this place is? Green Lane Masjid, what? Masjid Al-Aqsa, good, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Coventry Road is not as beautiful as this. No offense to Ahlul Birmingham. Now, what happened? What's the famous incident that happened here in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The changing of the Qibla. There's another big event that happened. Sorry? The night journey. Who can tell me about the night journey? <laughs> hmm. Sorry? Okay, yeah. The Prophet ﷺ traveled on a beast called Buraq. From where to where? Coventry Road to Ladypool? What? Sorry? From where to where? Jerusalem to the high heavens. And how did he get to Jerusalem? The H2? How did he get to Jerusalem? On the underground? Seriously, how did he get to Jerusalem? How did he get to Jerusalem, guys? Hmm? Okay. 
it's a buraq. Anybody else? Any other opinions? Okay. Yeah, a beast called the buraq. Okay. Now, the Prophet وسلم, wakes up in the morning and he informs everyone. Yeah? He goes out to the people and he says to them, Last night, in one night, I went from Mecca to Jerusalem and Jerusalem to the seven heavens. What kind of information is this? Hmm. Testimony. It's a report, right? Is it a truthful report? Or is it, is it coming from a liar? Truthful man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. But can the human being, his brain, human being's brain or science, does it tell us a person can go to Jerusalem and to the seven heavens in one night? Does it make sense? Logically, you can't explain it to me. Correct? Yes. Somebody curious would believe the Prophet ﷺ is true, but would say, how? Okay. When the Prophet ﷺ told the believers in Mecca about this night journey, some Muslims left Islam. Why did they leave Islam? They couldn't fathom it. What's the problem here? It defies physics. They thought, this defies physics, therefore it's not true. Now, there's one man who earned a title of a siddiq on this day because of how he responded to this. This is a good example of when your brain cannot accept something from revelation. How do you react? Abu Jahl and his cronies went to Abu Bakr. Did you hear what your friend said? He's saying now that in one night he went from here to Jerusalem and Jerusalem to the heavens. Abu Bakr Siddiq just asks one question. Did he really say it? They say yes. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said it. And then he says the famous words. لَإِنْ قَالَهُ فَقَدْ صدق. If he said it, if that man said it, it is true. Why is he believing this testimony? Why is he trusting it's true? The one who reported it, he trusts the person who reported it, the source. If he, anything comes out of Muhammad Wasallam's mouth, it is true. Why did he reach there? How did he reach that level where anything the Prophet said, he would just trust it's true? Through the miracles he saw from the Prophet Wasallam, the character of the Prophet Wasallam, he knew this man could not be a liar, he must be a messenger. So now anything that comes from his mouth, it's like unlocking your mobile phone. The mobile phone is trying to verify who you are, right? You are the right person. You are Hisham or Ahmed or Hamza or Akbar. Once it knows, either through facial recognition or fingerprint or passcode, once you're in, you can do anything you want, right? Similarly, once you verify this man is a messenger sent by Allah, he can say whatever he wants, he can say whatever comes out of his mouth, we trust him. Because it's a source, trustworthy source now. Okay. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, if he said it, he's spoken the truth. They said, really, do you believe he went in one night to Jerusalem and he returned before the morning? Abu Bakr said, Naam, usaddiquhu bima huwa a'zamu min dhalik. I trust things, I believe things which are even greater than this night journey. Usaddiquhu bi khabari samai ya'tihi ghadwatan wa rawhatan. I believe revelation comes from the heaven day and night. فَكَيْفَ لَا أُصَدِّقُهُ بِخَبَرِ الْأَرْضِ How can I not believe that he did a trip on the earth? When I believe angels in heaven are coming to him. Something more impossible for the mind. Why can't I believe he did one night journey? See the logic here. It all depends on do you trust the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you trust him, you trust what he says. If you're 50-50 about whether he really is a prophet or he's not a prophet, you'll start wondering, could it be true? Could it not be true? And what's part of this whole thing, very important part of this? Humility. Human beings think that everything can be understood by the mind, by the human mind. The human mind has limitations. There are things you can, human beings will never be able to understand. There are limits of the human mind. We all feel it at 9 p.m. Someone tries to ask us, what did you eat for breakfast? And the brain is so sleepy, it cannot even answer the question. We've all felt it in an exam hall. We get to a question and we realize we do not know the answer. We do not have all the answers. We have to be humble. Some things revelation informs us of is beyond our minds. We can never understand it. 
For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, On the day of judgment, some faces will be bright because they will be looking at their Lord. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi used to say, O oh Allah, I am, I am waiting to see you. I cannot wait to see you. Now, can your limited human brain understand how this eye is going to see Allah? Can the laws of physics explain it to me? No, it can't. Nothing can explain it to me. We don't know how it's going to happen, but we know it's going to happen. Because we trust revelation. Because it is a truthful source of testimony. We trust it. And it can be beyond our comprehension, but we trust it. Just because it's beyond our mind doesn't mean it's not true. Not necessarily. You don't understand how this phone works. The electromagnetism, the circuits, the electronics, the chips. You don't understand how it works. But it's here. It's beyond your mind, but it's true. It's two separate things. So human, the human mind may not understand how something works. That doesn't mean it's not true. Everybody with me? Everybody falling asleep? Okay, let's do a quick break exercise, Usman, before your question. Everybody stand up. Even the sisters have to stand up. Everybody has to stand up. Everybody's, even I'm standing. Everybody's going to stand up. You've all been sitting for one hour now. Everybody stand on your tippy toes. Okay, stretch. Don't uncover your aura, but stretch. Yeah? Okay, hands down. Turn to the right, turn to the left, give a massage to the person next to you, <laughs> I'm serious, give a massage to the person next to you, respecting their personal space, now you can all sit down, you can all sit down, because the next section is going to be an exercise for the brain, okay, Osman, your question? You know there's a saying in Arabic, فَاقِدُ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْطِي if, if you don't own something, you can't give it. You see, I have the cable, but the plug is being used. Do you want the cable? It's not plugged in. Do you want, do you want this cable? In, okay, خلاص. لا بأس. ما شاء الله. Allah says in the Quran, وَيُؤْتِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا Those who give to others even though they have a need. Fortunately, it wasn't me today. Okay, now we're going to take some examples to apply everything you learned. Okay, what did you learn so far? There are three sources of knowledge. These sources might have different levels of certainty. Okay? And these sources of information, you can understand them in different ways sometimes. If I told you this table was black, maybe I meant at night. Because it's not black. Right? For example. So things can be understood in different ways. Now we will take some examples. From the Quran, from the Sunnah. You tell me, you work out with the person next to you, how we can reconcile these two things. And once you have, I get your opinions, I will tell you what the scholars of Islam said about this, how they worked it out. Yes, you have questions? Anybody have a question? Khalas, bismillah. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf, ثُمَّ أَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا Dhul Qarnayn followed a path. Hatta idha balagha maghrib shams. Then he reached the sunset, the point of the sunset. Wajadaha taghrubu fi aynin hamiah. He found that the sun was setting into murky waters. He found the sun was setting into inside murky waters. So if you read this ayah and you take it upon its literal meaning, the sun, physically, the actual sun goes inside the water. That's the literal meaning of this ayah. Does that agree with your mind? Does that agree with science? And if not, how can we understand this ayah? You have four minutes. Talk to the person next to you.
When I see silence, that means you had enough time. Or you are stumped. Stumped by the wicked keeper. Yeah? Okay, who, come on, who's going to share with me some thoughts? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Okay. What's your name again, brother? Sorry? Ahsan. Yeah. So Ahsan says, from a human perspective, because the earth is a sphere, it's, a, it's a spherical, it looks like the sun is setting into the water. But if you were to follow the sun to the end, you would not find it setting into the water. It's just from what it looks like from the human eye. Is that right? What has he done there? Think back to the source of information. So which source is, is Ahsan using here? Sorry? The mind. So the mind tells you that the sun cannot set in the water? The eyes. I mean, the eyes, tell, the eyes tell you that it is, right? It looks like it is. But where did you get the idea that the earth is spherical and the sun doesn't set in the water? NASA, i.e. science, right? But this is one of those things that isn't just a theory. This is something that's... There's a picture from a telescope in space that the Earth is a sphere. Right? This is closer to the 100% side of certainty. Okay? And therefore, and because we know from science that the sun goes around the Earth, right? You're all nodding your head, you're all falling asleep. The sun goes around the Earth, right? In the solar system? Now, what's the, what happens? The Earth goes around the sun. You all said you did GCSE science. We need to return to school. Okay. So science tells us this. And the Quran is telling us that the, the sun setting into the water. Is it possible for them to be contradicting? We learn something that's a fact and the Quran is saying something different. Is it possible for them to contradict? That was the first rule we learned, right? Absolute fact about the universe. And Quran and Sunnah. And clear common sense, human reason, they do not contradict. We have to find a way to get them working in harmony. This is one way, is to say that what Allah is referring to is the human perspective. Okay, anybody else? Anybody wants to add to this? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Okay, good. So he's looking at the language. He's saying, Allah says, Wajadaha taghrubu. He found the sun setting. That's not the same as saying the sun sets. This in Arabic, there, there's a way to phrase this in Arabic. It's called muhkam and mutashabih. Muhkam is when Allah, when in Arabic, when you say something explicitly, this cup is on the table. It's so clear. If I said, I found there to be a cup, you could understand it in a few different ways, right? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes uses slightly unclear language, and sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses very, very clear language. So here you're saying, وَجَدَهَا تَغْرُبُ He found it setting, doesn't necessarily mean it's a 100% setting. 
You're saying the wording of the Quran allows there to be different ways to understand this ayah. Everybody with me? Yes? We need to do one more stretching exercise? No. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Any more insights? Hmm. It's only been one hour and nine minutes. If you're falling asleep, then we require provision of caffeine. Okay. What did Ibn Kathir say? Ibn Kathir said, option one. Option one is we take this ayah literally that Dhul Qarnain actually reached the point where the physical sun was setting. He says, فَهَذَا مُتَعَذِّرٌ This is almost impossible. So we're going to rule, out, rule that out. Option two. There are some narrations that say the sun physically followed Dhul Qarnain and when he reached the edge of the earth, the sun set behind him. He said these narrations are false. They are not authentic. And they're all made up lies from Ahlul Kitab. This is option two. Option three, the correct interpretation. He saw the sun setting from his perspective. And that is how anyone will see the sun when they are standing on the shore. It will look like the sun is setting into the water. See how Ibn Kathir did? Conflicting reports. So first... Is the report authentic? Yes. There are some ahadith. Are these ahadith authentic? No, they are false. That's throw that option in the bin. Is there a way to understand this ayah that agrees with the human mind and with uh, what we know about the universe? Yes. And he reaches this conclusion. So there is a wrestling. You have to go through the options. Option one, option two. You don't throw it straight. You don't throw the ayah or the meaning of the ayah straight away. You take them one by one. This is how the tafsir scholars were interpreted. Number two. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, reported by Abu Huraira, Sahih al-Bukhari, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ آدَمَ عَلَىٰ صُورَتِهِ سِتُونَ ذِرَاعًا أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم Allah created Adam alayhi salam, his form, and his height was 60 ذِرَاعًا which is approximately 30 meters in height. Now, scholars of hadith spent a lot of time trying to understand what this meant, but Someone made an observation. One of the scholars of Islam, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he made an observation. He said, who knows what this picture is of? Who knows what this picture is of? Sorry? Modern day where? In Jordan. Okay, these are the caves of? Of Petra. And if you go to the caves of Petra, you see the houses or the dwellings of some of the people in the past, Ad and Thamud, etc. Now, if you look at the height of these dwellings, they're really, really tall. Maybe 20 meters, 25 meters tall. So Ibn Hajar, he asked the question, if Allah created Adam alayhi some 30 meters tall, and today we are 2 meters tall, then you assume that over time, gradually, the height of human beings decreased. But I look at Ad and Thamud and their dwellings, and they're, they're nearly 30 meters. So it doesn't look like the height over time went down gradually. He asked a question. So this is something, where is this information coming from? Eyes. He's looking at the height of the caves and he's saying, hold on, that doesn't add up with the height of Adam a.s. Imagine a scholar, eight, nine centuries ago, is asking this question. They were digging, they were trying to understand, they were trying to make it match what we see and what we learn from the sunnah. So then, mashayikh, ulama, your turn. You've got three, four minutes. Talk to the person next to you. What's the solution? What are the possibilities? The hadith is authentic.
That's a discussion for another day. Ibn Hajar said, so he's just asking for me to repeat what Ibn Hajar said. The question he asked was, when you look at the height of these people, or the people of, uh, people of Samud, okay, and you see how tall they were, and you, if Adam salam was 30 meters in height, you would assume in all those hundreds and thousands of years that the height would have been maybe 15 meters. Because now we are like two, three meters tall. Are we? Yeah? Two point something meters, roughly? Yeah? What year did Adam Alayhi Salaam existed? Great way to start a debate. <laughs> we can't say decisively. We don't know the precise age and exactly how many years between us and Adam Alayhi Salaam. There's no uh, decisive opinion from the ulama exactly. But let's say, Ibn Hajar says, roughly, uh, if you look at a timeline, imagine this is a timeline, yeah? This is Adam alayhi salam, this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam's time, yeah? He's saying, Thamud was around here, was closer to us than to Adam. So by, by the time Thamud came about, their height should have been five or seven meters. So if the height is going down to two meters, it doesn't add up. With what I'm seeing. Make sense? So our ulama seven, eight centuries ago were trying to ask these questions. They were trying to understand. It's gotta it's gotta add up. It's all gotta add up. What you see, what you hear from Revelation, it's all gonna make sense together. Yes. Allahu Akbar. Brilliant. This is one opinion of what the scholars said, what Ishmaam is saying. One one opinion from the scholars was this was Adam alayhi's height in Jannah because Allah created him in Jannah. When he came to this dunya, he was a different height. Which we don't know exactly what height he was. But this is referring to his height in Jannah. Because the hadith is general. It doesn't specify where was this height. But it says Allah created him this way. We know where did Allah create Adam? Allah created Adam in the heavens, not on earth. Yes. We can't conclude that decisively. That's not what, because that's doing what science does. Right. Adam was 30 meters, therefore everyone's going to be 30 meters. Uh, Allahu Alam, I haven't come across that. It might be, I haven't come across that. I have very limited knowledge, so Allahu Alam, Allah knows best. Yes. Allahu Akbar. What's your name again? Hamza. Did you study some STEM subject? Are you in university? What Hamza is saying is very important. He's saying maybe the decrease in height wasn't linear. Yani 30 meters, 29, 28, 27. Maybe it was, it went up, then it went down, then it went up. Maybe it went up to 60, then it, we don't know between here and here how the height reduced. Ibn Hajar is assuming the height gradually went down. Yeah? Maybe it wasn't linear. Good, good question, yes. This is not something that I believe the ulama said. So this is something, but it's a fair question, fair possibility. Okay, so you're saying there's a theory that oxygen levels decrease over time, so maybe that affected. So maybe suddenly the heights went down. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so you're agreeing with... You didn't hear what he said. So he said maybe the height didn't go down linearly. Maybe it went like this. You think it's going to be linear? Okay, so you disagree with him. Brothers, we have a difference of opinion. Yes. Mm. Okay, he's saying, is it possible that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished certain people, their height was affected? Is that what you're saying? Possibility. Anybody else? Junaid, last one. Okay. Good point. <laughs> That's fine. A man who knows how to build extensions. A man who must be a civil engineer. So he said there's two possibilities. One is, this could have been a two, three-story house. Who told you that the height was this, this tall? 
you have to go there, you'll, you'll get it that it wasn't a two, three story house. But let's say, yeah, it's possible it was a two, three story house and the stories got demolished when the people, the, their dwellings were demolished, right? Because we know that they were, their dwellings were demolished. So what we're seeing is that what could have been three or four stories. That's okay. One, let's say one possibility. The other possibility you said was? Yes, this was the height of their forefathers thousands of years before and they just kept the same size of the house even as they became short. All possibilities. Okay. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfectly decent uh, possibility. These are all possibilities, right? What are we trying to do? We are trying to explain away the contradiction because there can be no contradiction between what we observe and what revelation informs us. Okay? So many scholars were of the opinion this was Adam's height in Jannah, and we don't know what his height was in this world. Okay? And other scholars were of the you know, they give other possibilities as well. Here's what Ibn Hajar says. I don't have an answer to this question right now. And that's okay. Ibn Hajar did not have a precise explanation for why this, he's seeing this. Does that mean he should throw the hadith in the bin and say it's, it's da'if? Does that mean he should say the Prophet ﷺ is a liar, we should not believe him? No, I retain my iman. I know it's true, but right now I don't have the full understanding. That's okay. This you call tawakkuf. I reserve judgment. Or tafweed. Allah knows best. But I, it you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you don't know how, doesn't mean it's not true. It might be your limited mind. See, now we know about malnourishment and the ice age and oxygen and multi story houses. So now we have many explanations. Right? Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, maybe he didn't have these explanations. Anyhow, uh, one of the most convincing answers that I find is that this was the height of Adam alayhi salam in Jannah. There are other explanations, but the point is the scholars are exploring, investigating, trying to fix this seemingly conflicting narration. Okay, example three Is the earth flat? Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu ja'ala lakumul arda bisafa. Allah made the earth wide and spread out. Okay, you got two, three minutes. Talk to the person next to you. Explain to me how can we understand this ayah in the light of what we know about the world. Bismillah. You have two, three minutes. Okay, Shabab, what are the answers to this question? Is the earth flat? Does this ayah say the earth is flat? Okay. It just says that the earth is in place. It just says the earth is spread out. It doesn't say the earth is flat. Okay, anybody else? 
Anybody think the earth is flat? Be honest with me. I will tell you, nobody is allowed to jump you after the class. I'll protect you. Tell me. It's okay. You can tell me. Trust me. Some scratches of the head, but no hands up. Yes, brother. You think the earth is flat? <laughs> Guys, after the class. That's going to I'm joking. Yes. So who, who can explain? Yes. Okay. Okay. You're saying the earth is a sphere, it's, it, but when you're on the ground, you can't see the curvature. You can't see that it's curved. Yes. Okay, so Ishmael is saying, we have the ability to go around the world now, and we know that when we go past this country, we don't fall off the edge. So that's, uh, you are saying that from observation, the earth is round. But the Quran says it's flat. You didn't explain me that, yes. Okay, I, you go, I don't want uh, further logical explanations why the earth is round. I want you to tell me this ayah specifically. Yeah? What gives you the right to change its meaning? Muharrifun. You guys are changing the meaning of the Quran, yes. Okay, you're saying widespread could mean a few different things, yes. Okay. Okay, mashallah. He's not talking, this eye is not talking about the whole earth, it's talking about the ground. Okay, yes. Brother, this is not going to save you afterwards. The brothers are still going to uh, yeah, and he pay you a visit. Yeah. <laughs> and yes? Sorry, one second before you continue. So we have a scientific theory the earth is round, and our brother is proposing another theory. We can't straight away reject him, right? We've got to take it seriously. Yes, brother, go ahead. Allah is saying the earth has been expanded for us to travel. He's not saying the earth is flat. Yes. You're scratching your head. Yes, yeah, Sheikh, you can't scratch your head in this circle. I'm joking. Go on. Chilling. Isn't there another ayah that says that the earth is round? Okay. Anybody remembers this ayah? Huh? Go on. You know, no, you said it. Say it again. Khalas, <laughs> la Okay, so it's from human perspective. Okay, what did Fakhruddin al-Razi say? Fakhruddin al-Razi, rahimahullah, said in his tafsir, the earth is a sphere. But if you look at any specific part of this earth, it looks wide and spread out to the human eye. Just like when Allah describes mountains, he says, jibala utada." The mountains are like pegs. But if you go to a specific part of the mountain, it looks flat. It doesn't look like a peg, right? Anybody, anybody ever driven up a mountain? Are there flat parts on the mountain? Places you can stand and eat and do barbecue, yeah? So how does Allah say the mountain is a peg? Doesn't mean the entire mountain is a peg, okay? So this is one. Now the point is, the point some of you caught on is, when Allah says, He made the earth widespread. This word bisata in Arabic or in, in Usul al-Tafsir in Islamic sciences, we call it muhtamilul ma'na. It can have more than one meaning. It has more than one possible meaning. You can look at it in different ways. If it has only one meaning, no, nothing else, we call it sarih al-ma'na. There's no, you can't twist the meaning here. It's too clear. But this word, you can see it in many different ways and it still makes sense. Okay? The last one. Last question, then you can all go home. This one is really, uh, you know, this one is really a difficult one. Okay? Allah says in the Quran, Allahu alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin Allah created seven heavens and a similar number of earths. Now, shall I tell you where it gets confusing? Ibn Abbas anhu said, There are seven earths, and on each earth there is a prophet like your prophet, and Adam like your Adam, 
أن نوح لك يا نوح أن إبراهيم لك يا إبراهيم أن عيسى لك عيسى How do you understand this hadith and this ayah? Six, seven minutes, inshallah, we'll finish. So just bear with me this last. Prove to me you have learned something today. Yes, Sheikh. Yes, Habibi. The word earth, yes. MashaAllah. SubhanAllah. Yes. Cannot confirm nor deny. I have to leave you to it. Okay, yes, brothers, what are the theories of the ulama? Yes. Every earth is, is that your answer? That every earth is its own world. So there are seven worlds, and there, what's your name? Sa'id, there's seven Sa'ids. Okay, he believes in the multiverse, yeah? There's multiple universes, and one Sa'id in every universe. But the other Sa'ids are not as smart as you. Allahumma barik. Yes, yeah, Sheikh, I cannot teach you uh, year three geography. <laughs> He's asking me how many continents are there. La quwwata illa billah. Yes, yes, Ishmael. Yes, yes. Hmm. So what does it mean? What's this? What's this he's doing with his hand? What are these? Layers. layers. Like shepherd's pie? Sahih? Lasagna? Yes, layers. Tabakat. Okay, so he's saying the they are referring to seven layers of heavens because there isn't seven skies. There's seven layers and there's seven layers of earth. Okay, yes. It's literal. There are seven worlds. What's your name? Talha. Seven Talhas. Which of them is the most handsome Talha? <laughs> but there's seven of Adams and seven of Nuhs. Okay, there are seven. So, what Talha is doing here, he's submitting. Submitting to the literal meaning of the scripture. This is true, but why are you so confident it's true? Because who informed you about it? Your Sheikh informed you about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it in the Quran, and Ibn Abbas said it. Anna said it. Yes, brother. Seven heavens. So he's saying there's seven heavens, and in every heaven there's one earth. This is like a very good shepherd's pie. Ah. Okay. Yes. Mashallah, all of you became physicists and philosophers in one moment. Yes, Sheikh, tell me. Hmm. 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 So seven identical universes with the same story. Different. The same, same prophets, but different stories. Okay, khalas, no more, no more explanations. Mashaikh, my brain is hurting from these seven layers and the earth and every layers. And, okay. Should I tell you what did the ulama say? Three scholars understood it. You know, they, they tried to wrestle with it in three different ways. Okay. Imam al-Bayhaqi rahimahullah said the hadith is weak. This narration of Ibn Abbas, where he says there's seven earths and seven prophets on one prophet on each earth that are identical, he said this is a weak hadith. And you can understand the ayah in different ways. That's what Imam al-Bayhaqi said. 
there's two narrators in the chain, they are untrustworthy, it's a weak hadith. Now, Ibn Kathir said, Rahimahullah, I agree with Bayhaqi, it's weak. If it were true, then probably these narrators got it from Banu Israel. We can't confirm nor deny. That's what the Prophet says. If you hear something from Banu Israel, from the Israelite tales, biblical tales, لا تصدقوها ولا تكذبوها. Don't confirm it, don't deny it. I don't know. Might be true, man. Okay. Third one, Imam al Dhahabi said. He says, لا نعتقد ذلك أصلا. I don't believe this hadith is weak. It's authentic. And then he said, وهذه بلية تحير السامع. This hadith is a test which confuses anybody listening. وهو من قبيل اسمع واسكت. This is one of those situations you just have to listen and close your mouth. I don't know. I don't know the answer. And that's okay. Sometimes we don't know the exact way to understand the hadith. We haven't understood it. Maybe one day we'll understand it. Maybe we'll never understand it. But we know it's true. If, if, if it's authentic, we know it's true. Yes. It's athar, correct. This is an athar. This is a statement of a companion of the Prophet But it still has a chain of narration. Some scholars still say it's authentic. So there's different ways of dealing with this, okay? Now, let us take some principles from these four examples, okay? If a hadith or ayah doesn't agree with science or reason, you should ask two questions. Number one, is it authentic? If no, no problem, you have no issues. If yes, you have to investigate. Now, is this hadith or ayah clear, explicit? Meaning it can only be understood in one way. There's no other way it can be understood. Like Allah made the earth expansive. You can understand this in different ways, right? There's muhtamilul ma'na. It has multiple possible meanings in the Arabic language. If it only has one meaning, and that one meaning goes against reason and science, now you have to investigate. Now, how do you? How did the scholars of Islam investigate? They would do three things. The first thing they would try is what's called jam'a. Both of these things are true. The Quran, this ayah is true. And this scientific fact is true. But we just have to find a way for them both to work. So maybe the ayah is metaphorical. Maybe it's not to be taken literally. For example, that's one way of saying, making them work. Or maybe the ayah is to be understood in a different way. You guys did that, right? We did that with some of the ayah. Now, if we can't, if they, if we can't do this, if we can't make them both work together, there's another way which is tarjih. We accept one, we reject the other. So maybe the hadith is abrogated or the hadith is weak or maybe this theory is false or maybe this information is untrue, etc. We have to choose one. That's another way. If you can't do that, then the last option is tafwil. I don't know yet. That doesn't mean I reject the wahi revelation. I will wait. Maybe one day I'll understand. My limited mind doesn't understand how to make this work together. I'll wait. Okay? Tafwil. So... You know, there's different options. Maybe the hadith is weak. Maybe it's fabricated. Maybe it's beyond your understanding, your comprehension. But it's true. Or maybe the hadith ayah can be understood in a different way so it makes sense. Okay? So it doesn't mean you reject the Quran. It doesn't mean you reject the science. There is, it depends. There are ways. Yeah? So inshallah, hopefully you all will be able to get these slides. These are the, this is the framework. Inshallah, you all learned something today. And uh, if anybody has any questions, we'll take them now. We'll try to close. What's the word in Arabic? The term in Arabic for a word that has multiple possible meanings? You could call it muhtamilul ma'na. It's a word that is muhtamilul ma'na. It could have many possible meanings in the Arabic language. Like, I'll give you an example, hand. The word hand could be in my hand. There's a clock's hand, right? So it could have multiple possible meanings. Anybody else? If I said watch, watch could mean the thing that tells the time. But watch could also mean I'm watching something. It could have multiple possible meanings. You can understand it in different ways. Yeah. Is there anything else you can follow this up with? Any explanations of books? I recommend uh, Seth Hamza George's book, The Divine Reality. And uh, that's the only book I can recommend at this time. There's not that much out there at the moment on this subject. Anybody else? Going once? 
Going twice. We'll check if the sisters have any questions. We'll go to Slido. Any questions from the sister side, they go to slido.com and they put in GLM sisters. Any questions, we'll wait a couple of minutes, if nothing. So while we're waiting for the sisters, can everybody share one thing they learned today? You know everybody, five people, one thing they learned today. Just one thing. SubhanAllah, that means I did a very bad job today. Hmm. From Tafsir ibn Kathir, how you can't, the sun set, doesn't mean the sun was physically going in the water, yes. The three sources of information are senses, testimony, and the mind, yes. Hmm. We should first, we should always investigate something. If there seems to be a conflict between the ayah and your mind, investigate it. See how it can be understood in a different way. Yes. MashaAllah. This is the number one principle you should go with. Common sense can never contradict authentic revelation or establish facts about the world around us. By the way, the investigation should be done by scholars. We are not always qualified to do those investigations. But we can try. You guys got a taste. But the main thing you should take away is don't throw it. Don't throw your deen out. Don't leave Islam like those people did when they heard about the Isra wal Mi'raj. Don't leave Islam because of that. Figure out, think about it. How could it work? Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Reflect on the creation of Allah and that will increase your iman. Yes, Akhi. Sometimes we don't understand and that's all right. This is very important. Yeah? Sometimes you have to just say, I don't know. Yes. Practical steps to reflect on the creation of Allah. Go to the Peak District, uh, climb a mountain in Wales, and just savor the beauty. Learn how things work. How does Allah send rain from the sky? How do cows, how, how do you get the milk on your table? And you start to realize the system is so sophisticated that the maker must be amazing. The designer must be amazing, right? You all admire this iPhone. Maybe I don't. But it, the more sophisticated this iPhone is, you feel, wow, the person who made it was genius. Apply that to the creation of Allah. Can anybody replicate his creation? Do you know any, anybody can try to replicate? Can anybody replicate the human eye? They can try. They can get close. They can't get there. And then you see the, the amazingness of what Allah has made. And while you are looking at Allah's creation, Say adhkar, subhanallah, subhanallah wa bihamdi. How amazing is Allah? And that will tie what you're seeing with what you believe. Yes. Okay, brother, this is a good practical one. Watch David Attenborough documentaries. Yeah, Planet Earth. All of them. Watch all of them because you really realize how amazing this world is Allah created. <laughs> no promotion of uh, any platforms. Tamam. <laughs> I think there's no question from the sister, from the sisters. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There's a talk after Maghrib. I know you're all tired of me, but if you aren't, then inshallah we'll see you after Maghrib. The topic is the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.